Chapter Nineteen of the Mystery of the Four Fingers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mystery of the Four Fingers by Fred M. White. Chapter Nineteen. Phantom Gold. Vera had entirely recovered her self-possession by this time. She was able to regard the men coolly and critically. There was nothing about them that suggested anything wrong or underhand. On the contrary, the girl rather liked their appearance. All the same, it was a strange and unique experience, and though Vera had been through a series of trials and tribulations, she thrilled now as she recognized how near she had been to the man who was thus running himself into the hands of justice. "'But how can you know anything about me?' she said. "'You surely do not mean to say that you suspect—' "'Not at all, miss,' Egan said civilly. "'Only, you see, it is always our business to know a great deal more than people imagine. I hope you won't suppose that we are going to take any advantage of our position here, or that we want you to betray Mr. Fenwick into our hands. But since we have been unfortunate enough to be discovered by you, we will ask you to go so far as to say nothing to Mr. Fenwick. If you tell him, you will be doing considerable harm to a great many deserving people who have suffered terribly at that man's hands. I think you understand." Vera understood only too well and yet her delicate sense of honour was slightly disturbed at the idea of continuing there without warning Fenwick of the danger that overshadowed him. Personally she would have liked to have told him exactly how he stood, and given him the opportunity to get away. Perhaps Egan saw something of this in Vera's face, for he went on to speak again. "'I know it isn't very nice for you, miss,' he said, "'and I am not surprised to see you hesitate. But seeing Mr. Fenwick has done you as much harm as anybody else—' "'How can you know that?' Vera exclaimed. "'Well, you see, it is our business to know everything. I feel quite certain that on reflection you will do nothing to defeat the ends of justice.' "'No,' Vera said thoughtfully. "'In any case, it cannot much matter. You are here to arrest Mr. Fenwick, and you probably know where he is to be found at the present moment.' "'There you are wrong, miss,' Grady said. "'We are not in a position at present to lay hands on our men.' We came here prepared to take a few risks, but I don't suppose you would care to hear anything about our methods. It will be a great favour to us, if you will retire to your room and stay there till morning." Vera went off without further ado, feeling once more that the current of events had come between her and the sleep that she so sorely needed. But in spite of everything she had youth and health on her side, and within a few minutes she was fast asleep. It was fairly late when she came down the next morning and she was rather surprised to find that Fenwick had not finished his breakfast. He sat there sullen and heavy-eyed, and had no more than a grunt for Vera in response to her morning greeting. He turned over his food with savage disapproval. Evidently, from the look of him, he had not only been up late overnight, he had also had more wine than was good for him. "'Who can eat rubbish like this?' he growled. "'The stuff isn't fit to feed a dog with. Look at this bacon!' "'You can expect nothing else,' Vera said coldly. "'If you choose to try and run a large house like this, with practically no servants beyond a caretaker and his wife, you must put up with the consequences. You are an exceedingly clever man, but you seem to have overlooked one fact, and that is the amount of gossip you are providing for the neighbours. It isn't as if we were still in town, where the man next door knows nothing of you and cares less. Here people are interested in their neighbours. It will cause quite a scandal when it comes known that you are occupying Lord Merton's house with nothing more than a number of questionable men. As far as I can see, you are far worse off here than if you had stayed in London. I may be wrong, of course." "'I begin to think you are quite right,' Fenwick grunted. "'I must see to this. It will never do for all these chattering magpies to pry into my business. You had better go into Canterbury this morning and see if you can't arrange for a proper staff of servants to come. Well, what's the matter now?' One of the men had come into the room with a telegram in his hand. He pitched it in a contemptuous way upon the table and withdrew, whistling unconcernedly. The man's manner was so flippant and familiar that Vera flushed with annoyance. "'I wish you would keep your subordinates a little more under your control,' she said. "'One hardly expects a man of your wealth to be treated in this way by his clerks.' But Fenwick was not listening. His brows were knotted in a sullen frown over the telegram that he held in his hand. He clutched the flimsy paper and threw it with a passionate gesture into the fire. Vera could see that his yellow face had grown strangely white, and that his coarse lips were trembling. He rose from the table, pushing his plate away from him. 
"'I've got to go to town at once,' he said. "'How strange it is that everything seems to have gone wrong of late. I shall be back again in time for dinner, and I shall be glad if you are good enough to see that I have something fit to eat. Perhaps you had better telephone to town for some servants. It doesn't much matter what you pay them, as long as they are good.' Fenwick walked rapidly from the room, and a few moments later Vera could see his car moving swiftly down the drive. On the whole, she was not sorry to have Fenwick out of the house. She was pleased, also, to know that he had made up his mind over the servant question. Already the house was beginning to look shabby and neglected. In the strong morning sunshine, Vera could see the dust lying everywhere. Her womanly instincts rebelled against this condition of things. She was not satisfied until she had set the telephone in motion, and settled the matter as far as the domestic staff was concerned. Then a sudden thought flashed into her mind. Here was the opportunity for examining the little room where Fenwick and his satellites had been busy the previous evening. Vera had not failed to notice the fact that three of the men had gone off with Fenwick in his car, so that, in all probability, they meant to accompany him to town. If this turned out to be correct, then there was only one man to be accounted for. Possibly, with the assistance of Gerald, the fourth man might be got out of the way. It was nearly three o'clock in the afternoon before Vera managed to see her husband. Eagerly and rapidly she told him all that had taken place the previous evening. Though she was rather surprised to find him manifesting less astonishment than she had expected. Venner smiled when Vera mentioned this. "'Oh, it is no new thing to me,' he said. "'I saw all that going on in your suite of rooms at the Great Empire Hotel, though I haven't the least notion what it all means. I should have thought that your interesting guardian was manufacturing counterfeit coins, but we managed to get hold of one of them, and a jeweler pronounced at once that it was a genuine sovereign. Still, there is no question of the fact that some underhand business is going on, and I am quite ready to assist you in finding out what it is. The point is whether the coast is clear or not. There is only one man left behind, Vera explained. All the rest have gone to London with Mr. Fenwick, who received a most disturbing telegram at breakfast this morning. Of course the old caretaker and his wife count for nothing. They are quite innocent parties, and merely regard their stay here as temporary, pending the arrival of our staff of servants. In that case I don't see why it shouldn't be managed, Venner said. You had better go back to the house, and I will call and see you. There is not the slightest reason why I shouldn't give my own name, nor is there the slightest reason why you should not show me over the house when I come. I dare say all this sounds a bit cheap, but one cannot be too careful in dealing with these people. It was all arranged exactly as Venner had suggested, and a little later Vera was shaking hands with her own husband, as if he were a perfect stranger. They proceeded presently to walk up the grand staircase and along the corridor, Vera doing the honors of the place and speaking in a manner calculated to deceive anybody who was listening. She stopped presently and clutched Venner's arm excitedly. She pointed to a doorway leading to a little room down the steps at the end of the corridor. There, she whispered, that is the room, and as far as I can see it is absolutely empty. What do you say to going in there now? The coast seems to be quite clear. Venner hesitated for a moment. It would be just as well, he thought, to err on the side of caution. A casual glance from the corridor disclosed nothing, except that on the table there stood a bottle apparently containing wine, for a glass of some dark ruby liquid stood beside it. Very rapidly Venner ran down the flight of stairs and looked into the room. "'There is nobody there for the moment,' he said. "'But that bulldog of Fenwick's can't be far off, for there's a half-smoked cigarette on the end of the table which has not yet gone out. I think I can see my way now to working this thing, without any trouble or danger.' Do you happen to know if that rheumatic old caretaker uses snuff? Really, I don't, Vera said with a smile. But what possible connection is there between the caretaker and his snuff? Never mind about that at present. Go down and ask the old man for his snuff-box. By the look of him, I am quite sure he indulges in the habit. Tell him you want to kill some insects in the conservatory. Tell him anything, so long as you get possession of the box for a few minutes. Vera flew off on her errand. She was some moments before she could make the old man understand what she needed. Then, with the air of one who parts with some treasure, he handed over to her a little tortoise-shell box, remarking at the same time that he had had it for the last sixty years, and would not part with it for anything. A moment later Vera was back again at the end of the corridor. 
Venner had not moved, a sure sign that no one had approached in the meantime. Taking the box from Vera's hand, and leaving her to guard the corridor, he stepped into the little room, where he proceeded to stir a little pellet of snuff into the glass of wine. This done, he immediately hurried Vera away to the other end of the corridor. "'I think that will be all right now,' he said. "'We have only got to wait till our man comes back, and give him a quarter of an hour. Snuff is a very strong drug, and within a few minutes of his finishing his wine he will be sound asleep on the floor.' It all fell out exactly as Venner had prophesied. The man came back presently, passing Vera and her companion without the slightest suspicion of anything being wrong. Then he turned into the little room and closed the door behind him. Half an hour passed before Vera knocked at the door on some frivolous pretext, but no answer came from the other side. She knocked again and again, after which she ventured to open the door. The wine-glass was empty. A half-finished cigarette smoldered on the floor and, by the side of it, lay the man in a deep and comatose sleep. Venner fairly turned him over with his foot, but the slumbering form gave no sign. The thing was safe now. "'We needn't worry ourselves for an hour or so,' Venner said. "'And now we have to see if we can discover the secrets of the prison-house. Evidently nothing is going on at present. I should like to know what the table is for. It is not unlike a modern gas-stove. I mean a gas-stove used for cooking purposes.' and here is a parcel on the table, just the same sort of parcel that the mysterious new sovereigns were wrapped up in. "'Oh, let me see,' Vera said eagerly, as she pulled the lid off the box. "'See, this stuff inside is just like asbestos. And sure enough, here is a layer of sovereigns on the top. How bright and new they look! I have never seen gold so attractive before. I—' Vera suddenly ceased to speak, and a sharp cry of pain escaped her, as she dropped to the floor one of the coins which she had taken in her hand. She was regarding her thumb and forefinger now with some dismay, for they were scorched and swollen. "'Those coins are red-hot,' she said. "'You try. But look out, you don't get burned.' Surely enough the coins were almost at white heat, so much so that a wax match placed on the edge of one flared instantly. Venner looked puzzled. He could not make it out. There was no fire in the room, and apparently no furnace or oven in which the metal could have been heated. Then he suddenly recollected that Vera must be in pain. "'My poor child,' he said, "'I am so sorry. You must go down to the old housekeeper at once, and get her to put something on your hand. Meanwhile, I will stay here and investigate, though I don't expect for a moment that I shall make any further discoveries.' Vera's hand was dressed at length, and the pain of the burn had somewhat abated, when Venner came down the stairs again. He shook his head in response to the questioning glance in Vera's eyes. "'Absolutely nothing,' he said. "'I found a safe there led into the wall, but then, you see, the safe has been built for years, and no doubt has been used by Lord Merton to store his plate and other valuables of that kind. It is just possible, of course, that Fenwick has the key of it, and that the safe has been cleared out for his use.' I am afraid we shall never solve this little puzzle until Fenwick is in the hands of those detectives who gave you such a fright last night. But there must have been some means of heating those coins, Vera protested. They must have come straight from a furnace. Of course, Venner said. The trouble is where to find the furnace. I am perfectly sure, too, that the sovereigns were genuine. Now what on earth can a man gain by taking current coins of the realm and making them red-hot? The only chance of a solution is for me to find Egan and Grady, and tell them of my discovery. I shall be at the same spot tomorrow afternoon, at the same time, and if I find anything out, I will let you know." There was nothing more for it than this, whereupon Venner went away, and Vera returned thoughtfully to the dining-room. She was just a little bit in doubt as to whether the man upstairs would guess the trick played upon him. But that she had to risk. End of chapter 19